Hello and welcome to Smart Beginnings for Tomorrow's Workforce. My name is Eric Tatum and I'm the Manager of Federal Energy Solutions, Business Development, Finance and Compliance for Dominion Energy. Today's event will be tweeted live by Abby Hills, Director of Communications for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. If you would like to follow along, you may do so at USCCF Foundation. A solid education that is available to every child is something that Dominion Energy takes very seriously. That's why we support educational programs from pre-K through high school graduation, from college level to adult continuing education courses. Dominion Energy is a strong proponent of early childhood learning as evidenced by our partnerships with Smart Beginnings and Fairfax Futures, along with representation from Paul Coons, Dominion Energy CEO of Power Generation on a statewide early childhood education board here in the Commonwealth. Beyond early childhood education, we are proud to have helped bring environmental education initiatives into Prince William County through programs like Project Planted, outdoor classrooms, including those at Piney Branch Elementary School and Coles Elementary School, and solar in schools involving a solar panel installation at T. Claywood Elementary School. High school students at Potomac High School have benefited from a partnership with Dominion Energy's Possum Point Power Station and the Northern Virginia Community College to, revi to revive and grow a welding tech education program. In addition, we are pleased that several Prince William County students have submitted winning essays in our long-standing Strong Men and Strong Women program contest and many students participated in a company-sponsored Envirothon each year, which is a competitive environmental stewardship program involving student teams at regional events across Virginia. Finally, Dominion Energy is proud to partner with both George Mason University and Northern Virginia Community College to help further their reach to post-high school adult learners with partnerships like George Mason University's SURE program and Northern Virginia Community College's Engineering and Technician Pipeline Initiative. We know that an investment in top quality educational programs is the hallmark of tomorrow's great leaders. I'd like to now draw your attention to some items at your table. The beautiful drawings were done by children in area pre-K classes. The painted rocks were created by young ladies at Molinari Juvenile Shelter Home. They have not always made the best decisions. For some, they may have grown up in supportive and nurturing environments. The words on the rocks are words of encouragement they wish they had heard as young children. Please take a rock with you as a reminder of how important smart beginnings are. You will also see some local and state data displayed at your table. Please take a moment to look at this data. I am honored and privileged that so many government and leaders in public education have taken the time to join us here today. Please allow me to introduce our honored guests. And I would ask that our honored guests wave from their seats, and I would ask everyone hold their applause to the end. Supervisor Ruth Anderson from the Occoquan District. Well, that worked very well. Vice Mayor Cheryl Bass from the City of Manassas. Brianna Sewell representing Congressman Jerry Connolly's office from the 11th Congressional District. Karen Kloss, representing Congressman Rob Whitman's office from the 1st Congressional District. 
Ross Snare, Chairman of Stewart's Office with the Board of County Supervisors. Superintendent Catherine McGorgan from Manassas City Public Schools. Superintendent Dr. Steve Waltz from Prince William County Public Schools. Associate Superintendent Rita Goss from Prince William County Public Schools. Associate Superintendent Dr. Jeff Jackson from Manassas Park City Schools. Former Delegate Rich Anderson. Thank you very much. Today's event is brought to you by Smart Beginnings, Greater Prince William, an affiliate of SPARC, which is the Education Foundation for Prince William County Public Schools, and today's event is also brought to you by Dominion Energy. Representing these organizations are Chairman Larry Hughes, Smart Beginnings, Greater Prince William. Larry, please stand. Executive Director, Kendra Pabalsa, Smart Beginnings, Greater Prince William. Executive Director, Sharon Henry Spark. Will the board members for Smart Beginnings, Greater Prince William, please stand and be recognized. Gina Davis of Imagination Learning Centers for her leadership in serving as chair of today's event. Gina, please stand. We are very blessed to have a strong and robust team of dedicated volunteers. Will our volunteer volunteers please stand with Gina to be recognized? Please stand. Associate Superintendent Rita Goss from Prince William County Public Schools, please stand. <laughs> you will notice a sponsor loop behind us. Thank you to our event sponsors that helped make this breakfast possible. You can see them on the screen behind me and on the back of the program, which may be found at your seat. I would like to point out a few specific sponsors. Our workforce development partner is the Prince William County Chamber of Commerce. Our event sponsors are Apple Federal Credit Union, Imagination Learning Centers, and Micron. Our speaker sponsor is Lakeshore Learning Materials. And once again, Dominion Energy is the presenting sponsor. Thank you to all our sponsors. I am proud to be a board member of Smart Beginnings Greater Prince William. I'd like to share with you a little information about this organization. Smart Beginnings provides leadership to champion a collaborative system of education and health services to prepare children for kindergarten and to prepare them for life. Smart Beginnings serves Prince William County, the city of Manassas, and Manassas Park, and is a program of SPARC, the Education Foundation for Prince William County Public Schools. Our priorities are literacy readiness, high quality learning experiences, and access to health services. We have worked with all three school divisions to increase the number of pre-K slots for at-risk children. I am pleased to say that in just three years, we have expanded pre-K to an additional 617 children per year. This represents an increase of over 1,000%. We 
We have provided over 5,000 literacy kits to babies and their parents through our Books for Babies program at Novant Health UVA Health Systems in Prince William and in Haymarket. We have given nearly 1,000 literacy kits to rising kindergartners who have no pre-K experience. We recognize the important role of parents in a child's development and education. We have provided training to parents of these rising kindergartners, giving them tools so they can confidently support their child's learning and become a partner with the classroom teacher. We have provided professional development training to nearly to over 500 early childhood professionals through our director's forums and training seminars. We also partnered with health and child care providers to implement utilization of standardization developmental screening instruments which support a child's healthy development. Now it is time to introduce our first keynote speaker who is Susanna Steen, Academic and Community Relations Manager, Micron, and also Chairman of the Education and Innovation Committee for the Prince William Chamber of Commerce. Susanna. Good morning. No worries, I'm actually not your keynote speaker. I'll just be, I will just be introducing the keynote speaker, one of them. But before I do so, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about the Prince William Chamber Education and Innovation Committee. So by show of hands, how many of you have ever attended one of our meetings or um, are, are a member of the Education and Innovation Committee? All right, thank you. But quite a few of us, right? Thank you, Doug. Uh, I also wanted to recognize my colleagues on the leadership team of the Education and Innovation Committee. We have my co-chair, Michelle, Michelle Rell. She was here earlier. She's right there. She's in the back. And also Eugene, our co-vice chair, and if we have Ramanda here from NOVA. So you may ask yourselves, why does the Prince William Chamber, which is a business association, right? Why does a chamber, um, which is not a charity, get involved with education? What sense does it make, right? Well, so, you know, as you may or may not know, education is closely tied to workforce development. Our organizations could not exist without, without a qualified workforce. And what better way to thrive than to have local qualified workforce, right? So um, we, are, we all represent our individual businesses, organizations, you know, higher education institutions, and K-12, as well as pre-K, and below. And so many of us get in, and that's why we come together. And with the power of one, we are able to impact and partner. And Smart Beginnings is uh, one of our partners, and so are all the school divisions that have been mentioned, and all the other organizations. So I will not go into all the details. What I wanted to share with you is that economic development is not going to be robust if we don't have robust education and robust workforce development. You will hear some statistics from um, the speakers who will follow, but I, I just wanted to leave you uh, with with a couple of pieces of information that I got from Justin Fairfax, uh, our lieutenant governor, when he was running. He came and spoke to some chamber members last year, and he said that for every person, every youth in juvenile detention center, Virginia spends $154,000 a year. For every person in prison, then it's about twenty-seven thousand a year. And in the again, uh, in the statistics that you will hear and that you have in front of you, a lot of it is tied to early childhood education. So if we if we get even earlier than K through twelve, we can make an impact later on and help our economy. So finally, before I introduce the, the speaker, the next speaker, I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of events. One is organized by our Education and Innovation Committee. It's going to be next Friday on the 27th of April. We will be at the Bristol Manor Golf Club, and we will have the Secretary of Education there uh, from Virginia, Atif Kwarni, who actually was a middle school teacher in Prince William Schools uh, before his, his current uh, appointment. And we will be giving out four $2,500 scholarships to deserving high school seniors, and we will also have an, um, a conversation about education and, and the need to get involved. 
And there is also an event on April 30th, organized by the Chamber. It is the um, it's Help Wanted, Looking for Qualified Employees. We will have some great speakers there, including Lavi Hamill, David Hunt, who is the CEO of, of the Skill Source Group, which is part of the Northern Virginia Workforce Development Board. I have some of my, my colleagues from the board there, uh, here in the room with me. And also Stephen Partridge, who is the Vice President for Workforce Development for the Northern Virginia Community College. I think these are two events that you should not miss. And finally, we also have a website through the Chamber, pwchamber.org slash CTE. We have partnered up with local career and technical education, so the Prince William Schools, Manassas City Schools, as well as Manassas Park City Schools. So very important for, uh, for our businesses and organizations to communicate to teachers and to students what is needed um, in the future in terms of careers. But, but without any further ado, finally, <laughs> finally, it is my pleasure to introduce an individual who champions rigorous educational standards and quality workforce initiatives, Lucy Davidson. Lucy is the program manager for the Center for Education and Workforce for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for the foundation of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. She leads the center's early, early education initiative that is, that is called Workforce of Today, Workforce of Tomorrow. She has played a significant role in partnering with chambers of commerce across the country to discuss the importance of high quality early education and inspire the business community to lead the way in reform efforts. Davidson also contributes to the development, management, and implementation of K-12 programs. Davidson, or Lucy, um, also contributed to a number of other publications, including Leading the Way, a guide to business engagement in early education. You can find that uh, copy at your seat. And Career Readiness, a business-led approach to supporting K-12 schools. Lucy worked for the Australian government where she drove reforms in education, employment, and disability services. In her position at the Department of Education and Employment, she was responsible for developing and implementing programs that improve outcomes for disadvantaged students in K-12 by increasing accountability and choice. So I wanted to ask Lucy Davidson to please come and join us. It's always a little awkward hearing your, your bio read out in situations like this. Um, but hopefully now my accent doesn't come as a surprise when I start speaking. Um, as Susanna said, my name is Lucy Davidson and I'm with the US Chamber of Commerce Centre for Education and Workforce. I'm really thrilled to be here today and would like to thank um, Smart Beginnings and, and all of the sponsors here for putting on such a fantastic event. Um, I'm here to talk about the business case for high quality childcare. I feel like um, Susanna already stole one of my lines, which is why are Chambers of Commerce here talking about childcare and early education? And she alluded to this, but I think the name of today's event makes this really clear. Strengthening the workforce of today and building the workforce of tomorrow. As representatives of the business community, we are the, the business community is one of the largest consumers of the education system, and having a high quality workforce is critical to growth. And so that's why at the US Chamber of Commerce, we are we're so committed to, to education and workforce and have spent many, many years focusing on education reform around the country in K-12, in higher education, and in workforce development initiatives. And while we have had some gains and communities across the country have made advancements, we know that we are still facing a number of um, significant challenges both in the workforce side and in the education side. You can see from this slide today that, and I'm just going to, sorry, tilt this up a little bit because I turn and move a lot and I want everyone to still hear me. Um, we know today that many businesses are struggling, struggling to attract and retain the high quality talent that they need to grow their businesses. Uh, two out of three businesses really struggle to fill open positions 
Many of these are open for more than 12 weeks and I'm sure any of you who have had a colleague leave and you've had to replace that position really understand the, the challenge that that poses for the organisation and, and the difficulty and then the overwork that that puts on other employees. And one of the reasons for this is that we have a real mismatch between the skills that people have and the open positions that are available. And so that skills gap across every industry around the country is having some pretty significant implications for businesses' ability to grow. By 2020, we expect that this skills gap is going to result in 6 million unfilled positions, which is just huge. And it's particularly concerning as we know that unemployment is going down and so there is less people available to fill those positions. So we really need to start thinking about different ways of expanding workforce participation and growing that labour force participation. At the same time, we know that the K-12 system is also not producing graduates with the skills that they need to succeed. Many of you here are in education and NAICS scores came out on Monday. And I think Virginia had some, some gains for fourth grade reading and math, around 50% of fourth graders are proficient in math. Um, but that wasn't necessarily the same across the country. And we saw for 12th graders that the results were pretty static. So we know that too many, and even one is too many, in our opinion, too many students are finishing school without the skills that they need to succeed in life, in college, and ultimately in the workforce. And so, while this is a problem that we see in the workforce, it has its roots in the classroom. And we know that those gaps and disadvantages are actually appearing earlier than school. And so that's why we think if we really want to grow the workforce of tomorrow and strengthen the workforce of today, we need a true generation solution to do this. And this is where high quality childcare comes in. At the US Chamber of Commerce, we really see this as a unique solution to building the workforce of today and strengthening the workforce of tomorrow, or you could building the workforce of tomorrow and strengthening the workforce of today, either way you want to say them. But it's all about thinking about what we can do to support parents and what we can do to ensure that all kids have the best start in life, which will enable them to succeed in school and beyond. And one of the, the great things about high quality childcare and early education is that it really affects every area of our, of our economy and our society. It strengthens businesses, it strengthens the economy, and it strengthens the workforce. And so, you might think that I'm, I'm reaching a little bit, that how does early education and childcare do all of those things? And, and why, when we focus so much energy on reform within the K-12 system, are we suddenly looking at babies and talking about the workforce? And that's because we need to think a little bit about how our education system was created. Many, many years ago, before probably all of us in this room were, were alive, the education model that we have today was developed around the agrarian model. So kids were um, going to school at a time that suited when their um, farming seasons were, when they might have to be harvesting and things like that. And the school system really has not kept up with advances in brain science and the research, and also to what we now know about the critical importance of a child's earliest years. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm sure anyone who is a parent in this room and who has seen a child grow and develop knows how much they're learning in those first few years, it's really only recently that the neuroscience has been really clear on this and has allowed us to, to implement and, and to think about this research when looking at early education policy. So I'm going to go through a little bit of brain science this morning and channel my inner neuroscientist, which I am not, so um, please, please excuse me, uh, my, my layman's approach. Um, but really, the key reason for why we think that we should be investing early is that a child is learning from the moment they are born, wherever they are. They don't wait until some arbitrary time when they go to school or when they go to pre-K. They're literally learning in every environment and whoever they are with. And so we know that brains are built, not born. Genes and experiences together build brains. So what is happening in a child's life, their surroundings, the environment they're in, is really critical in helping their brain to develop. Cognitive, social and emotional skills are intertwined. Toxic stress, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, damages brain architecture. Resilience is built 
through genes and experiences. It is not an internal character strength. And I think that's a really important thing to think about when we talk about building resilience in children. They're not born with it, you know. They, babies can't pull up bootstraps, they don't have any. <laughs> Um, and so when we're thinking about how to support resilience, it's important to know that. And then this one is certainly familiar to me as I've tried to learn languages and, and new skills as an adult. The brain's capacity for change and for learning new skills decreases over time. I still remember a lot more from my first grade Italian than I do from my college level Spanish, which probably says more about me, but um, it becomes much more expensive to, to change the brain over time. And so, I really like this slide because it shows a lot about what that brain architecture actually looks like. Children are developing one to two million synapses every second during the first 60 months of their life. So there's millions in the time that it has taken me to even say this sentence. And what these synapses do, they're forming the neural connections in their brains, which then help children understand how to react to and respond to different situations, learning what to do when someone smiles at you, learning how to respond when an adult interacts and things like that. And so you can see from the slide that at birth there are very few neural pathways. By age six, there are substantially more. And by 14, the brain's fine, no. Um, <laughs> that wouldn't say much better for all of us if it starts declining at 14. Um, but what that's really showing is that just like with muscles that we use and don't use, the brain starts to prune, to prune the neural pathways based on our experiences. So depending on the things that you're exposed to, the things that you need to react to, they become the most common pathways, the most used routes, so to speak, within the brain. And so if a child's life, early life, is made up of particularly negative experiences, if there are things like toxic stress, so um, stress around poverty, around housing, around abuse and neglect, then those pathways are wired differently. And this can also happen, um, and neglect is a key part of that. And so for a child, these neural pathways are formed very much by serve and return interaction. So children are born into an environment of relationships. And if those things are negative, it means that a child's brain will wire differently and that they will learn to respond to situations differently, which has some pretty significant consequences when we think about school readiness and the things that a child needs to master by the time they get to school. And so, yes, that's my, my little brain um, description. And so this stat just goes a little bit back to, to what I was talking about before, which is that the capacity for a brain to, to change decreases over time. So you can see right at the top there, um, has a high capacity to change in response to experiences, and then a significant amount of effort, a disproportionate amount of effort, as we get older, is required to change. And so it's just another reason why investing in the early years is so important. And another thing too is that, this is something that many of the employees in the room will probably understand, we increasingly hear that people want employees, they want young students, they want graduates, to have executive function skills, to be able to problem solve, to think critically, to work with others, to have these, these social and emotional skills or power skills or soft skills or whatever you want to call them. And while thankfully, you know, these are not finalized at age two, children do start laying the foundation for these skills at a really early age. And so we need to really support that development. I'm about to show you, no, this is gonna play a great video here, it doesn't have any sound. But it's really showing you the ability when in a supportive environment, the capacity of a child to problem solve, to think, to learn, to adjust, and to respond to their situation. And I'm not gonna talk through it because it's, it's a great video and I don't wanna distract, but it goes for a couple of minutes. <coughs>
But Auntie Jo might also have five kids from five other family members, and the kids might, by necessity, spend a lot of time in front of in front of the TV and miss out on their serve and return interactions, which are really critical to their growth. And the other side of this lack of access to high quality early education is the side for the current workforce. If parents do not have a high quality place where they feel comfortable leaving their child, they can't go to work. And so this historically was not as much of a problem because women were not involved in the workforce to the same extent. Most children did not grow up in households where both parents worked. That is no longer the case. Today, two out of three children under five are in households where both parents work. More women are in the workforce, which has made significant contributions to the growth of the economy since 1940. And 40% of primary breadwinners are mothers. Millennials, too, are now becoming a driving force in the economy. And just like with everything, they have different expectations around what a workplace is meant to look like and the kinds of benefits and expectations that they have from employers. And this is for both women and men. You'll see um, in the books that we have, have on the tables that um, men, too, would be prepared to leave their current job for one that had more family-friendly policies because they want to take a more active role in parenthood. And so... That means that we really need to think about how do we address these strategies. We know too that high quality childcare and early education is not affordable for many families, particularly for the families who need it. It is a serious financial burden for a large proportion of the population. And when you think about what that costs, you know, up to eleven to fifteen thousand dollars per child from age zero, you can understand why. You know, it's more than in-state college tuition in many states. And with college, you generally have 17 to 18 years to start thinking about preparing and how you're going to manage those costs. The same doesn't apply to childcare. And so, particularly for those on a minimum wage, 64% of income can be spent on childcare. And so, this is just a little bit more on lack of access. Quality is exceptionally hard to find. Only 10% of centres of licensed childcare providers around the country are considered high quality. And what this is doing, the combination of lack of access because of cost, affordability, and then just general availability as well, is forcing many families to choose whether or not to work or not. And so, as we outlined at the front, we have these huge challenges in terms of workforce participation and the skills gap, and then we have this group of parents Sometimes in their you know, early 30s, when they've got a significant amount of experience, are choosing to leave the workforce because they cannot have access to the care they need to support their families. And this is an issue for parents who are studying as well. For parents who were studying and those who dropped out, not having access to childcare was cited as one of the reasons why and as a barrier that if it had been overcome, would have helped them to finish their degrees. And so, it's easy to think, oh well, look, these are individual problems, these are not necessarily society problems. Families need to, you know, if you can't afford to have kids, don't have kids, whatever. But this affects business too. And not just in the, the everyday sense, it affects in terms of their money lost to the economy because of breakdowns in care. It costs businesses through lack of, um, through, sorry, through high turnover, poor retention, high absenteeism, it's really significant cost to their bottom line. And this is on a daily basis, an annual basis, whichever way you want to cut it. There have been studies that have shown in Louisiana that a lack of childcare costs the state of Louisiana 1.1 billion in spillover effects. So the impact that it has on every sector of the economy per year. That is a huge loss, particularly in a state which is already poor. And in 2004 figures, so we can imagine what it looks like today, over three billion annually is lost to the economy because of breakdowns in care. So there were some pretty significant, pretty significant figures. And so this is <laughs> the fun bit. We can solve this. Uh, well, one way we can solve this is through access to high quality childcare. We know that access to high quality childcare and early education settings benefits families, children, communities, and businesses and society overall. Childcare helps to increase wages of working families. Over the course of their lifetime, at an additional $79,000 for mothers. For working, and, sorry, and the return on investment for companies is high as well. A German study showed an ROI of up to 25% for companies who invested in childcare. 
We also know too through a new survey that the US Chamber Foundation commissioned recently that working parents want to reinvest in companies that invest in them. And so we see the parents saying, if my company provided childcare, if my company had family-friendly benefits, I would be more inclined to work more. I would be more inclined to take on some study to advance my skills to be more value to my employer. And that's a really compelling argument. We also know that access to childcare, whether that's on site or available, nearby availability or just support in finding childcare, can reduce um, turnover and increase retention. For the workforce of tomorrow, so strengthening the workforce of tomorrow, we, as we outlined before, high quality early education programs can act as a buffer to some of those negative stresses that I outlined. They also provide the necessary foundation that children need to succeed in school and beyond. All of those executive function skills, problem solving, all of those sorts of things are laid in those first couple of years. We know that participation in high quality early education programs also increases graduation rates, improves reading outcomes at third grade, and reduces the likelihood of children getting into that school to prison pipeline, and increases employment and graduation from university later on. And it has a significant impact on the economy too. For every one dollar invested, studies have shown, and this was a, a study undertaken by some economists in Minneapolis, Art Rolnick, who might be a familiar name to some of you in this room, found that public investment in early childhood education and investment generally can see $16 for every one in returns in the form of increased health outcomes, better tax revenue because we have more people going to the workforce, increased graduation, less money spent on remediation courses within school and then in um, university, as well as decreases um, in prison incarceration rates. So that's really significant. There's so many of the challenges that we face further down the education pipeline that can be addressed by upfront investments at the root cause. And the other thing too is that childcare and early education is a significant industry in and of its own right. They're members of chambers, they're part of industry organizations, they employ 1.6 million staff and have 41.5 billion in revenue. In a, one of our reports that you can take at, after the end of this session, um, you'll see a few more figures around the size of the childcare industry and how that compares to other similar industries. And so, what we at the US Chamber of Commerce recognize is that no one sector can solve this problem alone which is why it's so great to be here this morning and to see people from every sector, from education, the private sector, from government here. We think that this requires leadership from all areas. But as a business organisation, one of our calls to action is obviously around businesses and how businesses can get involved in this. And we see that there is a number of different ways that employees can do, employers and companies and, and business organisations can do this. You can support your employees and strengthen your bottom line. Find out what they need, provide care, offer subsidies, or just be a trusted source of information. There's also the opportunity to invest and support the broader community. Invest public dollars in philanthropic, sorry, invest philanthropic dollars in early learning. <coughs> um, connect with your local chamber and see what they're doing. You know, we heard that the Prince William County Chamber has an education and innovation network. Get involved in that, be part of it. Think about how you can make a contribution to the community or join a coalition. We've seen across many areas of education and workforce reform that coalitions and um, uncommon partnerships are really powerful um, in advocating for, for causes and, and affecting change. And at the national level, put early education on the map. Use your voice to be a leader at the state and national level and advocate for public policy that will make a difference. We've already seen examples from this around the country. So if you're looking and trying to think about exactly what you could do or what might be a good fit for your, for your workforce or for your community, we've seen some fantastic examples. From the Home Depot, thinking about what the care needs of their employees, if they're aligned to head office were and providing on-site childcare, and then also thinking about what some of the challenges were for the people in their off-site locations, because it might not be feasible to put a, um, a childcare centre at every single Home Depot store. But providing backup care, providing support to their employees at difficult times of year was a real priority for the company and it's paid off. Form partnerships. In Minnesota, um, to mention that, that state again, um, we saw 
Uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies coming together to form scholarships to provide to low-income children so that they could access high-quality early education. And the scholarships, because they were initially privately funded, were completely disconnected to any other form of, of social support. So there was no loss to the families for accepting these scholarships. At the same time, they were also drawing real reform in helping parents to understand what quality looked like. And so the parent aware rating systems in, in Minneapolis was largely driven by the efforts of the business community. In Louisiana, we're also seeing some great, some great efforts by the business community who are using their state policy framework to, to get the best outcomes for business and for early education providers. State tax credits have provided a rallying call in some communities to get businesses and organizations thinking about how they can get a tax benefit and then also improve outcomes in education. And so the savings from the tax credits that provided to childcare centers and community groups to increase access to professional development and things like that, which are directly connected to solving that challenge of poverty. And then, um, and one of the great examples that we have is actually from Virginia, think about shared services alliances. We know that childcare providers and early education providers, sometimes are small businesses, and sometimes struggle with many of the things that we as the business community take for granted or, or just know as being part and parcel of the job. Shared services providers, and there's a great example in, in Richmond, Virginia that has recently been set up, um, help to strengthen the financial sustainability of childcare providers by pooling resources, taking care of many of those back of house functions like HR and recruitment and, and facilities and things like that as well as providing curriculum and then enabling childcare centers and early education providers to focus on what they do best, providing high quality early education. And so you can read more about that in, in some of the resources on your tables and in um, the report that, that you can get at the end. But really, we just wanted, in, in closing, um, early education is critical for supporting the workforce of today and the workforce of tomorrow. It's a challenge that affects every aspect of the education pipeline and every community around the country. If you don't currently feel that childcare is affecting your organization, it's only a matter of time. It will be. And so this is an opportunity where we can really think about getting it right from the front end and having a powerful impact, not just on the current workforce, but on the workforce of generations to come. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucy, for your enlightening remarks. You know, the, that brain slide that, um, that Lucy presented nails crystal clear to me why my wife demanded that I read and read and read while my kids were like two, three, four years old. It must have worked. One graduated from Air Force Academy, one graduated from Cornell. So, we did something like that. And it becomes clear, the brain, you know, 90% of a child's brain is developed by age five. Very, very powerful presentation. Thank you very much. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Hudson, Regional Manager, Lakeshore Learning Materials. Jonathan. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Well, just a little bit about myself. I'm Jonathan Hudson. Uh, as Eric mentioned, I'm the regional manager for Lakeshore Learning Materials. My wife and I have four children, the youngest of which is five years old. She's currently in kindergarten. And the oldest is 14, and he's in middle school, about to go to high school. So we have the gambit covered as far as with children and their age ranges. But uh, we volunteered with Smart Beginnings in Richmond, and we actually helped with the pre-K readiness initiative. And it's fun to do that, it's fun to give back. Uh, that's really what Lakeshore is all about. It's a great company to work for. I worked for General Motors before this and got laid off and was explaining in the interview all the things that my wife and I do with our children, and that's how I ended up getting this job. And it's been great ever since. We actually have our own child development center in California at our headquarters where all the employees are able to have their children there and provide the great test bed for our new materials that we're coming out with. Um, we are really big on giving back and then being involved in the community. And with that, Kendra, I'd like to present this basket to you.
Thank you, Jonathan. We are going to use that basket along with several others that Jonathan and Lakeshore has provided. They will be raffled off to our high quality child care centers participating in our monthly directors forum. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And now before, I'm going to have you come back up to introduce our next speaker, but before we do, I want to recognize someone that was out of the room when Eric was doing uh, recognitions earlier. So if you'll bear with me just a second here, we have school board member Allison Satterway from the Gainesville District. Allison, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan. So it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Jack Allen is the Vice President and Deputy for Lockheed Martin's Undersea Systems Business Area. In this role, he is responsible for all undersea business, including the combat system for the Australian Future Submarine Program. Prior to his current role, Jack served as the Vice President of Anti-Submarine Warfare and Integration Programs Market Segment, where he was responsible for submarine, surface ship, and surveillance sonar programs, submarine imaging, and integration programs as well as the international submarine and coastal systems. Jack has over 20 years of experience working for submarine combat systems and acoustic for over 35 years of experience in the areas of program management, as well as systems and software engineering. Without further ado, Jack Allen. Thanks. Um, I kind of feel a little bit humbled in front of everyone. I don't feel like I have much to say to this group of people about early education, but I'll try. And after Lucy, I'm not sure what I can really say. But we'll try and do it. A couple things, I have a couple pictures in here, but I'm doing quite a bit of work in Australia, and so Lucy's accent seemed really familiar to us today. I'll talk about that a little as we go. And some similar things with problems and issues we have, we have here, I have in Australia as well. It's a, a worldwide problem. Uh, I'm just going to go through, be pretty informal, probably be relatively quick, because a lot of what I wanted to say was just covered, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, do it, I'll do it a little differently and talk about it kind of my way. Um, Mr. Chart. I got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're often been asked, let's just give a, uh, been there for 50 years. We have a facility that right now we have about 1,000 employees. Uh, about 20 years, that's actually about 30 years ago now, we have about 4,000 employees. I can talk about that a little as I go. We're starting to grow a little more now. We expect to grow about 10% this year and continue to grow. So I want to give you where we're located. When you look at the statistics on your table, on the table, for, for <coughs> excuse me, ready, ready for kindergarten, and you look at Manassas City and Manassas Park, that's where we are. And those statistics really kind of affect me, and I think they affect our workforce for the future, but then I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, what do we do? I'm, I'm going to really simplify this. We do, we do work largely for the U.S. Navy and the Australian Navy now, um, and we, we build electronic systems for submarines. If anybody's interested in that, I can talk about that offline. I'm not going to bore everybody. <laughs> but it's a work, <coughs> excuse me, highly technical workforce. Uh, if you go back to at our heyday, we were building computers, we were writing the software, we were doing everything ourselves. Tech World's changed that, and I think with the tech world changing that, that gives us opportunities and responsibilities that, that go with early childhood education. It really changed how I look at how we're starting to look at our workforce for the future. Uh, our workforce right now is probably three quarters post-secondary degree. We're highly Almost everything we do which is STEM, we hire engineers, and we've hired a lot of engineers. But like I talked, to, like I mentioned, uh, I left my phone my little problem on, on the table, but 10 years ago, iPhone didn't exist. 20 years ago, we had to build those things. Now, kids, I see three and four year old kids playing with phones, playing with computers. Yet we don't expect them to be able to go work in our workforce. So what we found, we've done a lot of work over the last year and a half, uh, is <coughs> we can get the, the better high school graduates who aren't going to college and have them do what used to be engineering jobs. 
So I have a chart. I'll probably just skip a lot of my charts and just talk a little bit. But I have a chart here: the projected workforce, projected workforce needs of what we need if we if we continue hiring the way we way way we have in the past is to grow our engineering needs in the country significantly. There's not going to be that many engineers. We already have a shortfall. If I want to continue hiring, I have to do something different. And what we found is there's a lot of quality people who aren't going to college, who aren't getting engineering degrees, but can do, can make a big impact on, on what I do today. Not even in the future, but what we do today we find a lot of jobs that used to take four-year and advanced degrees. Significant work can be done by people with high school, excuse me, just a high school degree. <coughs> excuse me, I don't have water here, but great. Excuse me one second. <coughs> so right now, it's pretty easy for me to kind of attract the high-quality kids, the better graduates who aren't going along give them an opportunity to either spend a couple of years and go to college or give them a career. But if I continue down this path, I'm not only going to be able to hire the best. And you look at the numbers and you look what, what it is, I'm going to hire probably, my statistics are going to change where I'm going to hopefully have 25% people without an advanced degree in what used to be engineering skills. So I'm going to have to hire, hire some of these people who aren't doing as well today. That's kind of my connection to this whole thing with early childhood. What do I need? Well, the, kid, the, the better kids, you know, they know how to go work with computers. They know how to work with these things. And the specific skills I can train. What I can't train is how to get along with each other, how to work well together, how to have that, that video you showed, let's see. If I had that kid, I can go use it. He's got all the skills. Wait, that's really what we need. And, and I can, we can train the rest. And, we, and we've shown that over and over again. So we reach deeper and deeper. But to get that, I need those socialization skills. And, and those are things that I think are really important. Uh, and I put my... Um, I could probably skip this because everybody's talked about this. But I will point out again, I'm kind of embarrassed about the Manassas City, Manassas Park. That's my backyard. That's where we need to work. And, and these, these numbers really have an impact on people. So I thank you for sharing them and putting them in front of everybody. And I'll continue to do my part and share these numbers and kind of encourage people. Um, but I kind of have my own way of describing this problem. <laughs> A lot of times I'll associate everything with dogs and dog training, and I can connect <clears throat> most things to that. But when you talk about early, and everyone loves puppies. You put a picture of the puppies, everyone's happy. And I want everyone to be happy when I'm done speaking. So. Um, but you look at puppies, and if you, ever, if you ever had a puppy, they tell you to socialize the puppy. And they tell you to give it a lot of experiences, they have to meet a lot of other dogs, have to meet a lot of other people, a lot of different experiences, have to learn to be patient, all those same things those kids were learning. Um, what happens if you don't do that is this. <laughs> when you look at dogs that haven't been socialized, they get in fights with other dogs, causes bad experiences. You know, if you're all involved in animals, it's the same. And it's the same with kids. So this is my way of really simplifying all those brain pictures. You know, I, I don't really understand the neurology, but I, but I get this. Yes. Especially when that's kind of a mastiff or something everybody gets. What we want is this. And I think that's what we're talking about. That's the impact. If those are people, that's the workforce I need. If you're not willing to get along, it's really... What I was telling somebody the other day, if you can't get along with people, you can't communicate with them, you better be really, really, really smart, or it's going to be hard to be successful. And you know, most people are average, so we need to learn to get along. And I think that's what this is all about. Um, I'm going to be pretty quick. I hope that's okay. But I, I kind of want to make some connections to some other things. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We've been here, I've been in Manassas, excuse me, the facility's been in Manassas for 50 years. And it kind of makes you think about history. And 50 years ago, 1968, 
1968, last week, some things happened in our country. Things happened in our country. Um, Martin Luther King got assassinated. Riots in the cities. And you look at what caused those riots, and you look at how we prevent them in the future. It's not just our workforce. It's our whole society. We have a responsibility to our society. And I just want to kind of mention, that's the real connection between what we do with our kids and what we, and what we do with our community's kids. It takes our whole community to bring up these kids. It's not just the parents. It's not just the child care. It's all of us. And I think that makes a difference in our country and our community. And so I just want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk a little bit. I would have talked a little longer, but like I say, Lucy, she did such a good job, and I feel a little embarrassed in comparison. <laughs> but, but I appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity, and we're going to continue to try and give back and do things that we can. So thank you. Jack. At this time, uh, we'd like to recognize another member that walked in a, a little late. School board member Robin Williams from the City of Manassas. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> now, there's an old saying, and I think Jack said as well, uh, it takes a village to raise a child. And so, uh, all of what we've been talking about this morning, what we've been hearing and listening about, it takes all of us as one to, uh, for the benefit of the good of all. So keep that in mind as we, uh, as we move through the program. Do you have a PowerPoint, huh? On behalf of Smart Beginnings, Greater Prince William, I'd like to thank both of our speakers. I certainly have a new and increased understanding of the complex issues facing employers with regards to their workforce needs of today while simultaneously building tomorrow's workforce. In just a few minutes, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers with both of our speakers. Fewer and fewer children are in and out of schools with the basic literacy skills they need to be successful in kindergarten and beyond. As business leaders, we know there is an increasing demand for jobs that require advanced education and skills. There's a cost savings when at-risk children attend a high-quality preschool and then achieve school readiness at the kindergarten entry level. This calculation includes lifetime savings costs by avoiding things such as specialized tutoring or literacy supports, special education, repeating a grade, criminal justice system, public assistance, and health issues. In Virginia, we are close to, be, to being able to access a longitudinal data system that will provide smart beginnings with data to calculate our actual cost savings. Michigan has such a system as been able to estimate their per child lifetime savings at $39,000 per child. As a community, we are making great strides. I mentioned earlier that many more at-risk children are receiving pre-K than just three years ago. The total number of at-risk children in pre-K is 1,196 children. If we apply Michigan's calculation to these 1,196 children, the potential for lifetime savings to our community of nearly $46 million. I now have a brief video I'd like to share with you. It's cool. 
fully grounded. I hope we move soon. I don't like Kevin. He's always yelling. This is my second birthday. We're all at daycare. Strapped in watching TV again. I wish I could just run around. This is my third birthday. My brother William's taking care of me while my mom sleeps. She works the night shift, so we can't turn up the TV. But we get to go to bed whenever we want.